Mr. Khan, the speech, your speech, your son's story, it is still what everyone is talking about, what most people remember from both conventions. Um, and polls show that it is shaping the U.S. election at the moment. Did you have any idea that you and your wife would have such an impact on what's happening right now? Not at all. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you and your audience. I had no idea. She had no idea. She had been my editor. I had written a longer version of it, and she said, no, we are not going to say this. You're not going to say this. But we had no idea at all that uh, it will have this impact. What has it been like the last few days? What have you seen from people, the reactions from people past the convention? Pouring of support and love and courtesy. Amazing, amazing. It reaffirmed our belief in the decency of America. This is wonderful. Human beings that live here are decent, caring, kind, thoughtful human beings. So the pouring of love and support and respect for us, for our son, had been wonderful to see. And it reaffirms our faith in the decency of America. Given the loss of your son and uh, what has happened to the United States, uh, the way the United States is perceived in the Middle East, do you think that the Iraq War was a mistake? It was a wrong decision. Time has proven it. I am not the only one that says that. Look back the history when this decision was being made. I still remain a private citizen. I am not a public speaker. I am not a politician. I am not in the public domain. But there are scores of patriotic Americans that said at the time when the decision was being made, do not do this. This is a mistake. This will not serve the interest of America. I was at my school in Cambridge. General Powell was the speaker. The very first word out of his mouth to the audience was, I apologize for that wrong decision. Time has proven that interest did not serve, that war did not serve the interest of America. So you came out and you spoke in support of Hillary Clinton. How can you support her if she voted to go to war? She only voted, but she did not start. She had no role in initial decisions, supporting something that she felt at that time that may serve the interest of America. In our lives, we take certain decisions, we take certain steps, and the moment we realize that this was wrong, we redeem ourselves, we withdraw from it, we do not pursue those decisions. And that is the difference, that on one hand, America is continuing to pursue, but those are long-term interests. But look at President Obama's stand, a definite end of the war in Iraq. Of course, you cannot just pack up and leave in one day. It takes time and all that. But there is change of heart and change of decision. Speaking of change of decision, change of heart, do you think people, not just in the United States, but around the world, got a glimpse of what a Muslim American is. By hearing your story, do you think that uh, you maybe have changed a few minds, people who were fearful of hearing the word Muslim? Yes. The emails, messages, these are very distinguished people of this country that are contacting and giving me their support. Some of them are saying, we were, it was in our heart, we were standing aside, we were standing on the sideline. But when we heard that a Muslim American, what he's saying is, is in our heart, we decided to disassociate ourselves from this rhetoric. And you cannot expect any better rebuke of 
the labels of condemning all religions, condemning all immigrants, condemning judges, disrespecting women. Enough. Somebody had to get up and say to this person, it gave his party leaders some pause. They have rebuked the statements made by the candidate for the presidency of this country. In the history that had not been, in the history of the United States, that had not been the case. That the party leadership is saying something different than the candidate is saying. And if an ordinary citizen, a Muslim, can touch that sense of decency, can touch that sense of morality, that says it all in itself that this country is decent, decent country in the world. Of course we make mistakes. Of course there is room to make it better. But that is by participation. My presence on that stage spoke volume. Had I not said a word, just standing there would have spoken about the greatness of the political process that a minority, an immigrant, a Muslim, could stand in front of that audience. And so it speaks volumes. Post 9-11, there was a lot of racial profiling, a lot of abuse directed at Muslim Americans. Did your family ever experience any of that? And compare that to what you've been experiencing in the last several days. It, it may be hard to believe, but we experience no discrimination, no threats, then or now. We were asked about this. We explained that these actions have nothing to do with Islam. Islam condemns these violence. The name of Islam had been hijacked by criminals the definition of these terms have been hijacked and have been manipulated. And that is the reason that I implore Donald Trump and his advisors to understand instead of condemning, join hands, because Muslims are as much victim of this terrorism as any other place or country, they have paid higher price. Therefore, the, the definition, the hijacking of the concepts need to be clarified. It's the obligation of Muslims to come forward and speak, and they are doing so. And their voice is being heard that this is crime. It's crime against humanity. And we all need to join hands together to solve it instead of building walls, throwing people out and all, it serves no purpose. Because outside the United States, as we speak, Muslims are being associated with the terror acts in Germany, in France, in Belgium. Uh, it's affected the political systems there. It's brought a lot of fear to Europe. What would you say to them over there? And, and what would you say as a solution, what would you give as a solution to move away from that? those fears are for reason. All of us as human beings, our first priority is our safety, our children's safety, our family's safety. So those concerns are genuine. We condemn the violence, but those feelings and fears are genuine. So you will ask, what is the solution that you suggest? The solution is that military action only cannot solve this, this type of menace, this type of menace of terrorism. What will solve military option is one part of the solution. It's communities joining hand together. Muslims, other communities, the governments, the local leadership joining hand together. What is causing these homegrown individuals is despair, being excluded from the community, 
have no hope in the community. They see no future in the community. Unless we change this, this homegrown terrorism, the menace of it, will continue to disturb us. Your critics are calling you a pawn of Hillary Clinton. Uh, you, I've read that you do not identify as Democrat or Republican. What would you say to those critics? Well, I have voted both ways in the past elections. I have voted Democratic because I like the president. I like President Obama from the day one he became candidate, and I will vote for him another 10 times. The kind of human being, decency and all. And I'll vote Democratic this election as well because I see the clear difference. Now, if people say I am pawn and non-pawn, my conscience is clear. Nobody has contacted me. Nobody has given me any speech to make. Nobody has given me. Uh, um, a hint, say this or don't say this. So the, whenever you say something of value, you don't receive 100% support. There are supporters, and there are people that will criticize you. So that comes with the, the burdens come with the work that you are doing. So it's part of the process. Did you have any idea that your words would have touched so many different people? And if your son were alive today, what do you think he'd think of all this? If he was with us, he'd be standing right here because that's what he was. His hand will be on my shoulder, and I would be receiving support from him. Sometime I feel that some strength that I have, I'm a humble, modest person, some strength I have is probably because of his light, because we knew him and we raised him for 27 years. So we knew who he was. And I can narrate story after story now that we reflect back, oh my God, what a blessed person we had for 27 years. What, we, what he taught us in his daily dealing with his friends, at his school, in his private life and all. It's that strength that is helping me utter these words. The second part of the comment that you made, the human suffering and human emotions are, don't have borders, don't have language barriers. These experiences are same for all of us. That is why it is resonating and it will continue to resonate because all of us at some stage in our life have experienced what we have experienced, coming to a place empty-handed, working hard, moving forward, having restored our dignity, claim to equal dignity. These are the dreams that all of us have, regardless of the borderlines. Mr. Khan, thank you for sharing your story, your family story with us. Thank you very much.